This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. The most important thing after salvation is the Word of God. The object of faith for a sinner is Jesus Christ. The object of faith for the one who's accepted Jesus Christ is now the Word of God. So Jesus is God's gift basically to the world and the Word is God's gift to his children. And because of that, we can grow in the Word of God and have joy. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. And today we're going to be getting into a subject called joy. We're going to talk about five sources of joy found from the Word of God. But I just want to talk to you for just a moment about satisfaction before that. You know, in heaven, we're going to stand there so satisfied with what we gave on earth. In fact, even wishing maybe we'd given more because we're going to see the results of our giving. Giving is like seed in this earth. Of course, the Bible compares your giving to seed, but seed is something you put in the ground. It outlives you. I mean, the tree is there, it produces fruit. The fruit produces more seed. The seed falls into the ground, produces more trees. And this is the way the kingdom of God is. You sow finances into a ministry and you may think, well, you got to wonder what ever happened to that thing. You know, without thinking about it, that seed goes around the world, gets planted into people's hearts. They get born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. Their life gets changed. They witness to other people. They spread seeds. Those seeds produce more Christians. And this thing just keeps on going and going long past the time you're gone. You realize we are here today because of the message that started on the day of Pentecost. But actually, it started before that. It started back all the way back to Adam when God produced coats for them to show them about the blood and show them about repentance and remission of sins. That thing comes down to today. And so again, at that day, an animal sacrificed its life so that others could live. Jesus became that one that sacrificed himself and is living in millions and millions of people today. When you get to heaven, two things God will never say to you. You went to church too much. Next of all, you gave too much money in the kingdom of God. Thank you for supporting this broadcast. That's what we're doing here. And the more you can give in your life, the more God blesses. And again, when heaven, we'll see the results of it. Anything we do down here, money we spend on anything else is temporary. But what we put in the kingdom of God is eternal. Thank you again. If you'd like to become a partner with me, go to bobbyandian.com. You'll find there how to become a partner with me. And boy, will I appreciate it. But more than that, God will appreciate it for help spreading the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me if you would today. At the book uh, book of uh, John, John chapter 5 and verse 11, you know, we'll find out, in fact, what I'm offering today on the broadcast is something that I, I don't think we've offered this before. It's called Choose Joy. It's something I did a number of years ago, but it really comes down to it, joy is a choice. I went with uh, Rick Renner, my wife, and I went to minister in uh, Latvia, and we went from there, we went over to Moscow. We're going to uh, minister in Moscow at the time. This was back when the Iron Curtain just fell in the very early 90s we went there. And uh, we got to Moscow, and so, uh, you know, Rick took us to the McDonald's. It was here, one of the biggest McDonald's in the world. But he told us how when they opened McDonald's, they hired these young people to work there, but nobody would ever smile. We couldn't even get them to smile. They actually had to take them from there, bring people in from other countries so that at least they could smile behind the counter and teach these young people how to smile. They had come up under communism. There's not even a reason to live each day. Every day was just an existence. And the, their life was filled with depression. And so uh, when they first got this job there, they didn't know how to smile, had no idea how to smile or what to smile about or what a smile represented. And so they had to teach them this. And then they found out something else too. They could force a smile, but you could tell that even worse. It was worse to see a person force a smile than it was to see a person without a smile. And so we've seen the same thing too. I mean, every time you ever gone into a McDonald's or something, somebody on the counter says, hello, glad to see you. You know, welcome to McDonald's. And you think, oh my goodness, no, I'm not advertising McDonald's. Okay, maybe McDonald's ought to pay me for this. You think so? Okay. Anyway, to go on with the sermon. Uh, you know, the, you, you see that fake smile on their face. And how often do you come to church? Maybe a person standing at the front of the church there. As you open up the door, they say, hi, welcome to Mr. So or Miss Fellowship here. And thank you for coming to church today. And they have this fake smile on their face. You think this isn't real. What God is saying is you start not with the smile. You start with joy on the inside. You choose joy. Joy is a choice. Then in whatever circumstance you're going through, you choose joy in that situation over frustration, anxiety, depression, uh, figuring out it's all going to fall apart. No, you look at joy because you realize God promised he's going to work it out. 
There's times when joy has, is really an anticipation of what's going to happen, not necessarily what's going on right now. We often look, well, if the circumstances are good, I should be filled with joy. If they're not, I shouldn't be filled with joy. But joy should be one of those things that's in your heart at all times and manifests itself on your face. We're told in James chapter 1 and verse 2, my brothers count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. Falling into different temptations, here's different trials and troubles of life. He says, count it all joy. Why? Because you've been through this before. God brought you out every single time. And he promised he would never leave you nor forsake you. And what he's done in the past, he'll do again. He's the author, the finisher, the completer of your faith. What you've begun in you, he'll complete. I mean, this thing goes on and on of all that God's going to do. Surrounded you by angels, surrounded you by promises, surround you with Jesus' blood. He's redeemed you and promised you a home in heaven. I mean, that's what that's down the road, but also promise to the in this lifetime, you're going to come through that all things are going to work together for your good. You start thinking about that, you're going to begin to smile. And again, here we come back to it. It's joy on the inside and the outside should be reflection of what's on the inside. And if it's not, it becomes fake. It becomes not real. And what we don't need is phony Christians around. We need honest, sincere Christians who operate in the love and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That is a command. God doesn't command you to do something you can't do. He commands you here to do something you are capable of doing, and you are capable of choosing joy in this situation. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says rejoice evermore. The verse we're looking at here, we're going to talk about five sources of joy. And the first one I want to bring out to you is hearing the word of God. In John chapter 15 and verse 11, look with me at this verse. It said, these things, this is commandments, the written word of God, the promises of the word of God. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Hearing and keeping and guarding and acting on the word of God produces joy in your life. In other words, it replaces the news of the day with the news from God. It replaces the news of CNN, the news of Fox or whatever station. It replaces it with the good news of the word of God, the good news that saved you and also the good news daily that brings you joy and happiness and deliverance. He not only delivered you from hell, he wants to deliver you from hell every day. He not only delivered you from going to hell, he wants to deliver you from being in the midst of hell every day. He wants to deliver you and you understand something, he will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death and there you shall have no fear in the midst of it. So again, he tells us that hearing the word of God brings joy that not only remains, but keeps being full on the inside of us. So it simply comes back to this. Do you lack joy in your life? Well, it doesn't come by just simply deciding, well, I guess I'm going to be joyful. No, it comes from something solid. And the first solid thing that God gives you after the new birth is the joy of the Lord that comes from his word. Jesus said in John chapter 8, when he was preaching that sermon, and suddenly in the midst of the sermon, the Jews started believing on him and said, Jesus said to those Jews who had just believed in him, he said, now, if you continue in my word... Then are you my disciples indeed, you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. He simply said, now that you've been born again, not only has God set you free, but now he wants to keep you free and he keeps you free, free through the word of God. So the most important thing after salvation is the word of God. The object of faith for a sinner is Jesus Christ. The object of faith for the one who's accepted Jesus Christ is now the word of God. So Jesus is God's gift basically to the world and the word is God's gift to his children. And because of that, we can grow in the word of God and have joy. And that's what Jesus said. When you continue in God's word daily, continue to thrive in God's word, then all of a sudden it begins to grow in you and great and mighty things begin to happen. So hearing the word of God brings joy. And again, Jesus said, not only that comes in you, but remains in you. And so it remains full and never does come to a point where we lose it. So it simply comes back again to this. Do you like joy in your life? Where's your study of the word of God? Where's your daily intake of the word of God? The Bible declares that the word is like your daily bread, just like they had daily bread back in the wilderness and they had just enough for that day. They had just enough for the next day, just enough for the next day. God's saying, take in my word that way. Let it be daily in your life. Don't expect that one trip on Sunday morning is going to last you through the entire week. How can you eat one, one uh, breakfast on Sunday morning and expect that to last you all the way till the next week? It cannot happen. You'll die that way. And many people are spiritually weak. 
many Christians are spiritually weak because they don't take in enough of God's word. And so there should be, if you have three meals a day, why not study the word of God three times a day? Let it be in the morning. Let it be in your on your lunch break. Let it be in the evening as you're, as you're meditating and thinking about the things of God, preparing. Boy, you put the word of God into you. What you, The last things you do when you go to bed is usually what you wake up remembering the next day. And it simply comes back to it, let the word of God be that source of joy in your life and that source of strength. The strength of God in you produces a joy on the outside of you. This is what happens. So again, what should you do? Well, listen to a teaching ta- uh, CD. I say tape, you can see what my generation is. Listen to a teaching CD. In fact, CDs are on their way out. Listen to uh, downloads and listen to flash drives and listen to a, a radio broadcast, whatever. But do that and make that consistent each and every day. I found I live close enough to work, my close enough to my office when I pass through, close enough to the job I have now as, as Bobby and in ministries, I can put a flash drive in on a sermon and hear half the sermon going there and half the sermon coming back. Every day I hear a sermon. In fact, most of the time I don't make it through that sermon because I stop it and think. I have to meditate on what was just there, what this minister said, what this evangelist said, what this teacher said. And suddenly I begin to think on that and then revelation starts to come. Believe me, revelation brings joy into your life. Revelation of the word of God brings that joy. And again, this is the type of joy that's there for that moment. And you need to continue in that because it'll continue and keep you full on the inside. So the first thing again is hearing the word of God brings joy. Number two, look with me at John chapter 16 and verse 24. Here it says, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. The second thing is there's a joy that comes through answered prayer. Say, yeah, but not that many prayers are answered. How many prayers have you thrown up to God? You realize maybe you're not seeing answered prayer because when's the last time you even threw it, put a prayer out there to be answered? You should write down your prayers. Write down, I have prayed for this. In fact, I know ministers that do this and they write down, I'm one of them too. There's times I haven't done it in, uh, in the, lately, but what I do is I write down the, the things I prayed for. And and uh, I had lists of these when I, was, when I was really young and first getting into the ministry of things I had anticipated, was praying for. And I'd pull that list out every once in a while and go, oh my goodness, that one's already been answered, scratched through. That one's already been answered, scratched through it. God wants to do the same thing for you. He's simply saying here in this verse of scripture, he He says, if you ask and you receive, he said, then your joy shall be full. There's a joy that comes through answered prayer. Matthew 15, verse 31, when they, that is the multitude, saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, they glorified the God of Israel. When they saw prayers being answered and Jesus praying for the sick and touching the sick, it brought joy into their heart. Acts chapter eight, verses seven and eight, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them and many who were paralyzed and those that were lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. Praise reports of healing bring joy. Notice not only did the healing bring joy, the manifestations bring joy, the casting out of devils bring joy, the answer to prayer bring joy, but the reports of it. How often is it important that we bring out a praise report in church and, and have people? I was in church just a few weeks ago and the pastor, my son, had people come up and give testimonies of answered prayer in their life and tremendous answered prayer. And the joy was incredible. People rejoicing, they remembered that testimony through the rest of the week. Here's the thing have prayers out there that you can put out there and walk away in faith knowing God's going to answer it. And when the answer comes, scratch it off the list. But I'll tell you, it'll bring joy to your life. When we come back, we're gonna look at three more areas that bring joy in the Christian life. See you right after the break. The moment you were born again, you were given the fruit of the Spirit. Inside you dwells a well of salvation, and it is your responsibility to draw from that well. The joy of the Lord is found in that well of salvation. But many Christians do not realize that joy is a choice and not a feeling that falls upon them. Joy is often overlooked, yet it is one of the greatest powers of the Christian life. Joy will bring strength and healing to the life of every believer who will choose to walk in this fruit of the Spirit. This three-part series will teach you to tap into the joy of the Lord to find strength, healing, and victory in your life. Sermon titles include The Healing Power of Joy, The Sources of Joy, and Joy Has a Voice. To order Choose Joy, go to bobbyandian.com or call 918-250-2207. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobbyandian.com 
and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. Right before the break, I was talking about reasons that we have for joy, five sources of joy in the Word of God. And here's the first one we talked about. The first one was hearing the Word of God brings joy, that the Word of God in us produces joy. And that was found in John 15, 11. He said, these commandments I have written to you that by them you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may continue to be full. The second area we talked about, and I want to reiterate this one, is there's a joy that comes through answered prayer. Are you putting enough prayers out there I want to speak to you specifically. And that is the fact, when is the last time you wrote down a prayer? When's the last time you made mention of it and recorded it so that you can go back and look at it? Journaling is a big thing today. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone through weight loss programs. They ask you to journal what you eat. After a while, I forget and have to go back and put it down there. And I can go at the end of the day and check that off. When's the last time you wrote down your prayers that you have prayed? And when you pray another prayer, you pray and you write it down. Keep it in the front of a Bible or keep it in the front of your iPad or whatever you carry around. And Look at that, and you'll find after a few weeks, after a few months, you go, oh, that one was answered. Didn't even think about it. You say, oh, I prayed about that. Yeah, I prayed about that. And all of a sudden, joy begins to come to your heart. Answered prayer brings joy. We come back to it. I want to go to the third one right now. And the third one is in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. Turn there with me. This says, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. These things is introducing the remainder of this chapter on the importance of us as Christians confessing our sins or having a clean conscience between us and God. A clean conscience is a source of joy in your life, but a clean conscience has to come only when you have sinned that you confess that sin, get rid of it, know that Jesus Christ has answered your prayer. 1 John 1, 9, this is leading into 1 John 1, 9 and simply saying, if you have any sin in your life, you cannot have fullness of joy. Then you have that fake smile on your face again. You have that pretense of joy, but you have no joy to back it. After a while, people can see you're nothing but phony. Scratch that little surface joy off the outside of you, you find bitterness of heart underneath it. And the only way to get rid, rid of bitterness of heart is to understand God has cleansed me. You can't cleanse yourself. It's as much the grace of God after salvation that cleanses your daily sin as it was when you got saved that cleansed your sin that keep you out of heaven and kept you from eternal life. So sins as a sinner are removed by the blood of Jesus Christ at salvation and sins of a Christian after salvation are removed also by the blood of Jesus by confessing that sin, 1 John 1, 9. And by doing so, verse four says, you have fullness of joy, a cleansed heart and an open relationship and an open fellowship between you and God produces joy in your life. So freedom from sin produces abundance of joy. Notice what he said here, that your joy may be full here in John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. These things are speaking about remaining in fellowship with God. There's two areas that we have. Number one is relationship, and that was settled when we received Jesus as Lord and Savior. God slapped a one-way ticket, put it in our pocket, and we're going to heaven. So that was settled at the new birth. But after the new birth, we still commit sins. And we grow to where we sin less and less because we grow in the word of God. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. These exceeding great and precious promises are given to us that by them, those exceeding great and precious promises, that we might uh, have, walk in fullness of joy and our sins and we resist the temptations that are in the world through lust. So we have power against sin when we're filled with the word of God and what we use against Satan in circumstances. It is written, it is written, it is written. So God's desire is that we come to a point where we sin not, but daily we do commit sins. And that becomes less and less as we grow older in the Lord, more mature in the Lord, we have more power in the Lord, more understanding and more ability to say no when temptation comes. So it comes back again, that's fellowship with God. Our relationship is settled, but our fellowship can be in and out, much like a child in your family. The relationship was settled the moment that child was born, but fellowship can be something in and out. In other words, I love all my children, but I have more respect toward certain ones of them. I'm happier with certain ones of them. And the ones I'm happier with are those that just do what I ask him to do. Jesus simply said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That brings joy to the heart of the Lord. And it's simply saying here, it brings joy to our heart to know we are in fellowship with him. And again, that's brought out later on here in this chapter in verses 10 and 11, talking about the fellowship we have with the Lord. These things are about remaining in fellowship with God. Sin robs us of our joy. David prayed not that he would be restored back to a relationship with God. He said, Lord, I pray for you, restore unto me the joy of 
of your salvation. Notice he didn't ask for his salvation back because he already had salvation. He asked for the joy of his salvation. So joy comes, and number one, we talked about through the word of God. Number two, we talked about was answered prayer. And in this one, forgiveness of daily sins brings a joy into our life. These things we write to you that you may have joy. These things write me unto you that your joy may be full. And as long as there's sin in your life and unconfessed sins that hasn't been, listen, I know I've got sins that I've committed since I've become a Christian. You know why I still have joy? Because God has forgiven them. God has forgotten them. And it's over. I can remember them if I decide to pull them back up, but there's no need to. Paul even said, forgetting those things which are behind. Now there comes a point when I can look back on them and learn from them. I can honestly evaluate them without getting mad at myself or upset with myself or kicking myself or asking why I was so stupid, those days are over. I can honestly evaluate, look at it, figure out how I tripped, how I fell, where the temptation came, and again, how that next time I'll know when that thing comes along, how to get away from it. So again, freedom from sin in our life brings abundance of joy. David prayed again, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. There's a joy that nothing else can give when our heart is pure and clean before God. And this is called God even cleansing our consciousness. So to have a clean conscience between us and God is so valuable and so important. So let's go to number four. Number four is found in 2 John verse 12. 2 John chapter uh, there is no chapters. There's just 2 John verse 12. And 2 John 12 says this, having many things we write to you, I would not write with pen and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Here's the other thing that happens. Fellowship with God was the moment before this, but fellowship with people is so important. We're living in a day to day and it just, it shocks me so much that uh, people aren't going to church and they say, well, I'll just stay home and watch it on a television screen or I'll watch it on my computer screen and stuff. I'll just, you know, go to the website and I can watch it and I I don't have to physically be there. There's nothing that replaces being around people, fellowship with people, talking to people. Church is not just so you can hear the word and walk out the door and go home. One of the greatest thrills I got, in fact, our church was known when I first took it as a teaching center, not as a church. And how was that? Well, it was a call to teaching center because we basically came and teaching was the big thing then. We grew up on preaching. Everybody preached a sermon. Most everybody preached one sermon. Next, we preached another sermon. But teaching churches actually begin to teach in series. Next Sunday, we'll take up where we left off. It was like revolutionary, but our church was just called a teaching church. We basically had no music program. We had no youth program. We had no children's program. You came, you brought the family, you sat there and you walked out the door. And so my wife and I being raised in a traditional church thought, you know what? You can still be a teaching center and have the teaching be the number one thing, but still have all these other things. Man, we need groups that people can get involved in. I'm simply here to tell you that a choir is simply a small church under a big church. It's part of the church, but it's a smaller church within the church. The youth group is a smaller church within the church. The singles department, a smaller church within the church. The ushers, the greeters, and all the ones again. So we started, I started pushing hard for people to become involved. And man, we had a music department and going stuff like that. You know what happened? You couldn't get people to leave. Before that time, when I first took the church, man, you said, all right, church is dismissed. They were all gone. I mean, people ran for the door, got out of there, and they left and went home. And you used to stand around and think, man, I used to stand around when I was young and see people just fellowshipping all the time and people going to lunch with each other. And you almost had to shoo them out the door so you could lock the doors, especially in the evening service. So what happened was things began to change as fellowship comes. There were four reasons that made the early church successful. It said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That brings joy. That was our first point. It said, next of all, it says, and in breaking of bread, fellowship and prayers. Fellowship was very important. Breaking of bread, having meals at the church together. Breaking of bread is not just the communion elements. That is called breaking of bread. But breaking of bread, there was literally where the church comes together and they eat together. And then they have fellowship with each other. I go to ministry ministers conferences. And I'll tell you, when I'm at a minister's conference, I learn from the speaker. I speak sometimes. But the point of it is, I really learn just as much, if not more, sitting around the table, fellowshipping with other ministers, those of like precious faith. And this verse is telling us here, how these things I write to you, uh, he says, I write with pen and ink. That's great to read the word of God, stay the word of God, but he goes on to say, but nothing can compare to when I'm there with you face to face and we're having fellowship with each other. 
You know, we can fellowship with the world, but our intimate fellowship has to be with Christians. In other words, we can uh, hang around the world, we can work with the world, but you tell you what, you cannot be best friends with the world. You can be friendly with the world, but you cannot be friends with the world. James tells us to be friends with the world makes you an enemy of God because the world operates under a different system. So it simply comes back to this. You wanna go out to a movie, you wanna go out to eat with some people, first thing you think about is Christian friends because you can fellowship with them truly fellowship and the intimacy of the Lord and talk about deeper things than just what you would talk about at the office with other people. And so there's times you can go to lunch with maybe somebody at the office, but the purpose should be, I'm going to display for them and talk to them about the Christian way of life. So the, the type of fellowship we have with the world is to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But intimate fellowship has to come from believers. And here Paul is saying, I led you to the Lord, and then you led others to the Lord. The church has now grown. I want to meet those people that have been led the Lord because I want to have a friendship with them and a fellowship with them I cannot have with the world. So fellowship with the believers brings us joy. So Paul looked forward to the times he could return to be with the churches and the ministers and have great joy. 2 Timothy 1.4 reiterates this, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I might be filled with joy. Acts 20 and verse 38, sorrowing most for all of the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. When they thought they wouldn't see Paul anymore, they sorrowed and joy comes. Philippians 4.1, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, you are my joy and my crown. The last one I mentioned number five is found in Acts chapter two and verse 46. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house that eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart. Attending and becoming involved in a local church brings joy. And I'll tell you what, when I meet people that don't go to church, they sit and watch it on a television screen. My whole thing is, this is not what God said. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, assembling of yourselves. That means all of you together in the church. You're not gonna witness the rapture on a screen. You're not gonna sit in heaven in your mansion and watch on a screen what's going on around the throne. You're gonna participate. And God said church on earth should be the closest thing to heaven while we're here as possible. And in heaven, you'll fellowship. In heaven, you have loud praise. In heaven, you have shouting and rejoicing. That should be going on in the church. In heaven, we'll have instruction in the word of God. That should be happening here on this earth. And the closest thing to heaven itself is coming to church. Don't break that. Don't separate yourself from that. Say, well, I'm not just an outgoing person. Well, go to church anyway, because the Bible says, if you want friends, show yourself friendly. Purpose to go to church and say hi to somebody. Most every service I've been to has a short period of time where you turn around and introduce yourself to somebody else. And I would say, well, here we go again. This is just a routine. No, it's an important part of the Christian life. And that is coming to church, attending church, and again, attending and becoming involved in the church is a way to fulfill all four areas that we have talked about before and have fullness of joy. In church, we are in God's presence. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy and his presence is found within the local church. Five sources of joy. I'm sure you might find some more, but these are the main ones found in the word of God. See you next time. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250 2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.